in the script, but I just felt I wanted to do this. Uh, the actual reading we've had is actually about a, a, a second chance, an, another opportunity uh, that came and that God breaked in uh, into this person's life and he saved them. And, and I was, while well, we were, Sue was leading us and we were worshipping, I, I just felt, you know, I was asking a, a question, if you like, a rhetorical question. Uh, how many chances does God give us? Now, this has got nothing to do with the sermon. I just feel I've just got to bring you to game. How many chances does God give us? How many chances has God given you to come back to him, to live right for him? And so this is a bit different because sometimes you sort of build that this is, you know, the big drum roll at the end of the sermon and, uh, you know, we're going to make an appeal and you put your hand up and all that. We'll do all of that anyway. But I'm just trying to be obedient to what I believe come on. the Holy Spirit is saying at this time. And uh, I, I, whether you sense that you need uh, another chance or not, we all need another chance with God. And each day is a new beginning in Him, isn't it? Yes. Each day is a, another opportunity. Uh, one of my heroes is Charles Finney, great American revivalist. And uh, he used to commit his life to Christ every day. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, this is for the Why Jesus booklet that we use, uh, and we use on the Alpha course, and uh, we give these out to people. And there's a prayer, it's on page 18, I can memorise the, the page, I'll just say, get, pick up the book, page 18, read it, if it becomes your prayer from your heart, then God will do something with that. Amen. Amen. So I, I want to read this phrase by phrase. I want you, I want you to shut your eyes. If you want to have a posture of open hands before God, that, that's up to you completely. But just make it your prayer. Maybe you say, well, I'm fine, but I just want to recommit myself to him. And maybe there's, there's someone or some more than one that really needs that second chance with God today. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things done I've done wrong in my life. Maybe just think about what they may be. I ask for your forgiveness. I now turn from everything I know is wrong. I thank you that you died for me on the cross so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you for this offer of forgiveness and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm having a new beginning with God today. Amen. A new beginning with Him. Amen. Amen. So, uh, unlike David's soothing voice, uh, that can send us to sleep. You've got me, which I will not send you to sleep. Amen. I have been known to nudge people. But I don't think you'll need nudging. And we're talking about uh, no appetite. Um, and this is part of our series of great Bible stories. It, great stories from the Bible. Stories that people who don't go to church, who have got no sympathy with, or any religion or whatever, people say to me, oh, I'm not religious, and I love it when they say that to me, you know. I say, nor am I. <laughs> I remember on a plane once, and there was a man next to me, we were traveling, we were going to India, and, and he could see the notes I was reading, and that was obviously some connotation with church and whatever, and he said, are you, are you a priest? 
and I said, oh, no, I'm not a priest, and I tried to explain, and, uh, and I said, have you got any faith? And he said, oh, I'm not religious. And I said, uh, nor am I. Oh, is it just a vocation? Oh, man, we had a lovely time. And he couldn't go anywhere. He's sitting next to me. Yeah, unless he's got a parachute, he was stuck. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, God can give you God opportunities. See, we're not religious. It's about a relationship. And, and so people have got lots of ideas and uh, thoughts. Maybe it's from their Sunday school work. And we thank God for the kids' church. Amen. I said, thank God for the kids' Amen. church. Amen. Some of you remember when we didn't have any children. Can you remember that? Yes. And now uh, uh, there were some people that said, you will never attract children. Hello? <laughs> how many say, how many want to make a vow, never say never? Yes. Never say never. It's never too late. That's why I just felt we wanted. It's never too late with God. And if you prayed that, and if there's something happening in your life right now, hallelujah. Please talk to us afterwards. Please, we'll pray with you. We'll bless you. Uh, anyway, great Bible stories. Somebody did a survey of some of the great Bible uh, uh, stories. And um, there's obviously loads. But this is the top ten. You know, there's some of those programs, the top ten Elton John songs or something, you know. <laughs> Just to sell cornflakes, isn't it, really, through your TV. Anyway, so there's uh, the top ten. And so, uh, number one, creation, Adam and Eve. That's a tricky one nowadays. I mean, if God created me a male, excuse me, if he created us male and female, what are we doing? Messing up with what God has said. You see, the creation issue is an issue. We need to address that issue theologically. And uh, so the creation story, uh, the uh, Noah and the ark, uh, number two, Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Great. I'm going to preach on all of these this morning. No, no. <laughs> David and Goliath, we've actually looked at that in, uh, in this series, and we called it Size Doesn't Matter. All the messages are there on the internet. And YouTube as well, if you so wish. Um, Daniel in the Fiery Furnace. Daniel in the Lion's Den, which is what you might have guessed we're focusing on this morning. Um, uh, Jonah and the Big Fish, or the Whale. The birth of Christ, we're coming into nativity time and we're coming into that very, you know, people go, oh, well, that wasn't the date and all that. Yeah, forget that. The fact is, historically and theologically, God broke into our world. Hallelujah. That's a great, great story that Jesus coming to dwell among us. Jesus feeds the 5,000 and it's like that sometimes, isn't it, church stuff? But, uh, and then the number 10, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. So as I've said, today we're going to focus on Daniel in the lion's den. And I've called it No Appetite. I'd like you to participate. So everybody say No <laughs> Appetite. appetite. <laughs> okay. The overview, really, um, we're going to look at uh, Daniel's appetite. The official's appetite, the king's appetite, the lion's appetite. Okay? So we'll work through this. The officials had no appetite for <clears throat> Daniel's righteous ways. So we got the idea of the story now. The Darius sets up these 120 people to oversee his kingdom, which was vast. And then Daniel with these other two, he sets up to oversee the 120. So we're talking about power, responsibility. The other two officials had got a problem. 
because there's corruption going on. Is there anything new under the sun? Mm. There's corruption going on, and you know, you you do this. Remember the old cash for questions stuff? Well, some of you are too young, I can tell. Uh, but you know, and there's we, now all, all sorts of stuff is coming up through the woodwork, isn't it? Coming out of the floorboards of corruption. You know, when we see corruption in high places, especially in the church, it's time to pray, friends. It's time to call on God and ask for a revival. Yes. It's time to turn back to God. Oh. And so they have, they, they have no appetite for Daniel because Daniel was a righteous man. Now we get all mixed up about what that looks like because, you know, we don't. Daniel kept the law. Daniel kept the Torah. He was a Torah-keeping Jew. And he knew to his own nation's expense and cost what it had cost for them not to keep what God had commanded them to keep. And he was one of these children, a young man, and now in this story he's an old man, but <laughs> as a young man, taken up from his country, taken away from the temple worship, taken away from the very things that he loved. And he knew, he, because of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah wasn't a, a, a very popular prophet. Jeremiah wasn't a seeker service <laughs> preacher. He told them the way it was and they didn't like it. They even put him, his own people put him in a pit at one point. But we need some people to tell us the way it is so that we can get from where we are to where we should be. Amen? And um, anyway, Daniel knew and he he walked in righteousness with his God. It wasn't legalism. He just walked in righteousness. Jesus said, for those who follow Jesus, how much more should your righteousness surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees? So we are called to walk within God's boundaries. Walk within. That's, and by the way, it's just totally free. A total freedom... And total freedom is being God's bond servant. And Daniel was one of these. And he kept, he wouldn't take bribes, he was not corrupt, he did everything right, and everybody knew about his faith. Does everybody know about your faith? Mm -hmm. And uh, so his other two guys didn't like him. And, and the story says that they concocted this idea where, this is going to pander to the king, his ego, you know, we're going to have 30 days. Because in the, 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 the Persians and the Medes believed in those days that the king was a deity, a god. Just as the Romans adopted that as well, the Caesars. And so his, uh, they bring up this... 30-day thing that nobody else should, no other God, there's loads of gods that they worship, but no other God but to you, O okay. King. And Darius didn't see through it, basically. He allowed himself to be corrupted by and influenced by these people. So he, he puts this edict up that God that no other god should be worshipped. Because they knew that if Daniel would keep praying, what would you do? What would you do? Well, perhaps I'll pretend not to be praying, but I'll, I'll go for a prayer walk. I've gone on a few prayer walks, and you walk in along talking to God, and if you're praying out loud and somebody else comes around the corner, you pretend you're going to... I mean, nowadays it's easier because you've got mobile phones and... Uh, Remember once we were doing a prayer walk around the area, and uh, it wasn't that long ago actually. And uh, uh, there was up by Princess Park, and there was the, there was some children in the park, and I wanted to sort of stand on the perimeter, and I was standing there, and I thought, I want to pray, but they're going to see my mouth moving, and they're going to think, am I right? <laughs> yeah. So what I did, I get my mobile phone out and pretend I'm on the phone, 
And I'm talking to God, oh God, save these people. Oh God, break through, break through into the schools, break through into our community. And they thought I was talking to somebody. Well, I was. <laughs> so Daniel, you know, he kept up his prayer life and they knew what would happen. A man that he's long since gone, Frederick, great name, Frederick Tapford. He says, loyalty to God may lead to difficulties and even danger, but it must ultimately lead to safety. Loyalty. You see, I, I, it's so wrong when people say, just come to Jesus, it's going to be a wonderful, sweet life. It's going to be tough. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and be different. Don't try and blend in. Some people want to be different because they, they want to be religious different, like miserable looking. And some people don't need any training in that, I've noticed. <laughs> or dress strange. Or we're going to have the old songs. and That's not what it's about. It's about living different. It's about walking righteously. <clears throat> It's about standing out, it's about being salt, it's about being light, it's about being an irritant in society. Jane calls me eerie sometimes. <laughs> Number two, Daniel had no appetite to conform. He had no appetite to conform. You know the problem with the Western church? It's got a great big appetite just to conform. Mm. Just be like the rest of them. Well, you know, it doesn't matter. And, I mean, we are told, aren't we, by the media, by these barons, dictating to us how to interpret the news, not alone listen to it, but we are told that the church has got to keep up. Well, I don't know what church that is, but it's not the church I belong to. We're not keeping up with the world. I've got no appetite, friends, no appetite to conform to this world. But Paul writes, doesn't he? Be, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently, act differently. But be joyful. Come on. Paul also writes in Colossians, he says this, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds. The old version says, set your affection, which means minds, but I love that word, affection. Set your, where's your affection this morning? Well, it's okay, because we started off well, didn't we? We've come back into line. Set your affections, set your minds on things. That we, we need to be a people that have no appetite for this world. This world, the old song, is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Heaven beckons me. And I don't feel at home in this world anymore. You know, when, when Jesus came into my life all those years ago, I, I, just, I just knew that this world was not my home. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy things that you enjoy. I, 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 I watch films. I, you know, and I, I want to engage. But I'm not of this world, and nor are you, and nor should you be. And I tell you, if you want people to come, if you want people to come to the stuff, and we've got to go out as well, but if you want people to come, be different in a good way. Be different. Dare to be different. Dare to be uh, Daniel. So Daniel had no appetite. Darius... The king, although he liked Daniel, he had no appetite to stand up to his officials. 
I don't know what your politics is, and we're not going to go there, and this is never the place for politics. Okay? But for all the politicians, I want to say this, and whatever party, and whatever stream, whatever colour, stand up, for goodness sake. Stand up for what is morally right. I, I mistakenly, we mistakenly, my wife and I, ended up watching Question Time the other night. <laughs> I haven't watched it for ages, but it so winds me up. <laughs> and the bias. I mean, it must be rent a crowd from somewhere. The bias that's in that room is oh, dreadful. But, you know, let's just keep paying our license fee and let them do it. And they're talking about gender issues. Right? Big, big, hot potato stuff. And you should see them right across. There was obviously a couple of like uh, writers on there, and there's politicians from the different brands. And oh, this would be good. One time a day, from a t particular brand, particular uh, colour, you might say blue, you'd have had a clear Christian stance on these moral issues. Sorry. It was all waffle and squirming and trying to get out of it because they are so scared that somebody will not vote for them. If they say, oh, somebody, and this was in Newcastle, the, somebody from the crowd put their hand up. He was brilliant. And he said, in, in essence, he said, nobody on the platform has got any leadership whatsoever, we need leadership in this land. Darius was swayed by the officials. We need to pray for our leaders. Whatever your politics are, pray for our leaders. I can remember back in the Thatcher government and in a prayer meeting, and there was a guy who was part of our church who was a strong Labour supporter. That was fun. <laughs> and he had, you know, you may be a Labour supporter, you may be a Lib Dem, you may be conservative, whatever it is, you know, we're called to pray for our leaders. So I prayed for Maggie, and I prayed for the cabinet, and I prayed for the, you know, the, what was going on. I prayed this prayer, and this guy who was a socialist, he came up to me and he said, well, You've just prayed a socialist policy on the Conservative government. <laughs> Whatever. I just want to see what is right. So you can, it's great to have your views, and please vote, 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 vote. Always oh, don't, don't, don't say, oh, it's all correct. Vote. Pray. Pray over who to vote. But we need to pray for them that we'll have righteous, upright leaders who will stand up. Darius didn't stand up. He had no appetite for it. After Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, Darius himself literally had no appetite for food. He fasted. He had no appetite to sleep. He had no appetite for entertainment. You ever been there when you just so moved and touched that you say, I, you know, I can't even, I can't even crash out. I've got to get this prayed through. I've got to get this. Well, he, he wasn't a believer as such, but he, he has this night where he has no food, he has no refreshments, he has no entertainment, and he's just so, so concerned because he felt boxed in, and he was boxed in. And that's what they do. They play politics with you, and they box you in. They want to get you to say something. Like we had an email sent to our website. What was our view? Did we welcome everybody, same sex and all that? I'm not going to explain what I said and how we came through that, but I'll, I'll tell you afterwards if you want to know. Uh, but uh, and yet, uh, when that email came, I thought, well, it's either from the Daily Mail to try and catch me out, it's either from the far right to see if we're, you know, whatever, or it, it is somebody who's genuinely wants to know if they're going to be welcome here. I'll tell you after when we're not on show. So he had no appetite for food and drink. And it seems that the lions didn't have an appetite that night. 
Have you noticed that? Or did they? Or did they? Well, they certainly got an appetite. I read somewhere in, in Europe where uh, there was this uh, keeper and a, a lion had got through, a lioness had got through, and it, thankfully for the people who were at the zoo uh, who threw stones at this creature, it's a beautiful creature, but this keeper was being mauled to death because it was a territorial thing. So Daniel was coming into their territory, and yet he comes out unscathed. They have no appetite. Did they go on a fast that night? And it says, um, it says, the break of day, the king rose and went in haste to the den of lions, and he came near to the den where Daniel was, and he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God you serve continually, I love this, being able to deliver you. This is what the world wants to know. Is our God able to deliver us? See, you might want to make a stand today, and I pray you do, but then you will have to make a stand, and then your testimony is of how God helped you in that situation. How many never, ever have to face any difficulties in this room? Right, well, I'm not going to do any funerals because you'd have been dead if you were one of those. We all face difficulties. Has your God able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said, oh, king, live forever, which was a, a polite gesture back. What were they supposed to say? God has sent his angel to shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king. I just get this, I, I don't know, I see things in pictures sometimes. And I just get this idea of the angel coming and putting a muscle on each other. And the lions are going, I just, I'm just like a chunk of that. I mean, it's like I'm, a, I'm, sure, I'm sure it'd be very delicious. But I really, seriously, I wonder how the night panned out. And so we can get a romantic idea. And I could have put up pictures where a, paint, a painting, where there's this beautiful painting of old Daniel, and, and uh, he's looking up, because they're looking at the shaft that's been opened, and uh, obviously the voice is coming down, are you still there, and all that. And uh, the lions are all round him, and he's got his one hand on the lion, he's stroking the mane, and it's all a lovely romantic picture, but was it really like that? Well, I don't know. The scriptures have decided not to tell us, but all I can tell you about my own experience, I, I've only got my experience and you've only got yours, yes? And I know this, that if I have a sleepless night, if I have a restless night, and I get up and the, it, says, it says there's one like, he prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And uh, there's stuff going on in my head, there's stuff going on, and I'm, uh, sometimes it's nothing to do with me, sometimes I'm just concerned about people in the church, sometimes I'm just concerned, just, you know, I'm concerned about national, global issues. I remember I was, one of these times I was concerned about what, radical faith that was infiltrating schools, etc., etc., that was harmful to children and and I was really breaking my heart for children and uh, and I said to God the trouble is with the church it's too fragmented and as soon as the words had gone out of my mouth God spoke to me in those first that, that moment he said yes and what are you doing about it and since then we've endeavored to be part of what we're doing tonight the upper room and kingdom come events and and like-minded leaders because where, where there's unity god does what he commands the blessing but unity is, is something we have to work out so in that time i wonder what it was like daniel would have known jeremiah i wondered this and i quote but it, he would because he later he quotes back to God, Daniel, uh, Jeremiah, when he sees that Jeremiah said that they would be in captivity for 70 years. And that's when we'll see that in our Bible studies when we go and pray 
and, was, uh, and, they, and he said, Lord, these 70 years are nearly up. It's time for us to go. Come on, open the door now. We have to pray the scriptures in. We have to pray. It's not just going to float down like a blancmange. It's got to happen. You have to, somebody somewhere has got to pray. Hallelujah. And uh, this is Jeremiah 32, 27. It says, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. This is God speaking through the prophet. I am the, the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Now you need, somebody might need to hear that this morning. Is anything too hard? Is that situation, is that sickness, is that circumstance, is the state of the nation, the state of the church too hard for me? No, says the Lord. Nothing is impossible. Nothing. So we wrestle. And I, I just get this sense that maybe this was what was happening with Daniel. You see, the, this roaring lion, he comes to bring anxiety. Anybody know what anxiety looks like? It comes to bring frustration. Do you know what frustration looks like? See, Paul says that uh, we would have come to such and such a place, but Satan hindered us. Frustration, anxiety, fear. Anybody know what fear looks like? He's the enemy. He comes to rob, to steal, and to destroy. He comes to remind us of our failures. Oh, he reminds me. For I've learned when he starts to tell me my failures, I don't deny my failures. I just say, you know what? That's true. Take it up with Jesus. Take it up with Jesus. But there's a standoff. You have to resist and stand off. I remember the enemy trying to hinder me from going forward when I was in India in 1992. And I felt so homesick, I wanted to come home and I wanted to cut short the journey. But it was one of those nights when I, and I had to pray through. That's all Pentecostal saying. But pray through. We need to get that saying back into the church. Pray through. Pray through. And I prayed and prayed until the homesickness lifted off to me. And after that, we saw over 100 people come to Christ in the, in the meetings that we were at in Jalanda City in North India. Pray through. Don't give up. The Hebrew writer says, angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to the, to the believer. I can hear Daniel say, Lord, as he gets down, he's on the floor there, and there's all the lions. And I can hear them moving and roaring. And, you know, and he goes, Lord, send your angel. Hebrew writer says, are they not all ministering spirits sent to minister? You have an angel. Jesus said, 